Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Turn in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. <laughs> Only here do you get applause for the announcement, turn to Galatians. I love it. Galatians chapter 1. Well, I'm with you when it comes to uh, getting excited about this book. I feel like the psalmist in Psalm 45 verse 1 he said, my heart is overflowing with a good theme. And the theme that the book of Galatians is all about is the theme of God's grace and God's unmerited, undeserved favor and the liberty, the freedom that we have because of that grace. So it is a great theme, although huh, Paul's tone, as you will see, uh, is not like um, a lot of his other books. You know, when you open a letter, you can tell pretty quickly if it's going to be a friendly letter or if it's going to be a little more rigid of a letter or it's going to even be a angry letter. And the tone in Galatians is different than the tone in Ephesians or Philippians or Thessalonians. Uh, it is... Well, Paul puts his war paint on in this book. He puts his boxing gloves on. He uh, is unhappy with a situation going on in the churches in Galatia. And because of that, he begins his letter differently. So all of his letters begin with a salutation, but Typically, when Paul writes a letter, he writes words of commendation. Like, you guys are awesome, and, you know, may God open your heart, because you, 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 like the Thessalonians, the word of God has sounded forth all over the place. Everybody's heard of it. He always has some word of commendation. There is no word of commendation to the Galatians. Though he loves them, hence his letter to them, but it is more of a polemic. It is more of a defense of... It is more of um, an attack on those who have attacked him in the church of Galatia. Those who are attacking this beautiful gospel of God's grace. And so the book of Galatians will, will rectify that. Just to show you some of the language uh, getting started, I know we're supposed to be starting Galatians 1, and therefore I'm going to take you to Galatians 2. Um, in verse 4, notice, but this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty in which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. That's what he's worried about. Somebody's doing something that's bothering Paul because it is bringing bondage to the church of Galatia. If you go over to chapter 4 and verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Verse 9, now, after you have known God, or rather are known by him, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? What is happening here? There were a group of people in the early church. We've run into them before, and we run into them now again. They were called Judaizers. Ever heard that term? Judaizers. Judaizers was a term to describe Jewish people who had become Christians but believed that the only way to be saved as a Christian was to become a Jew first. And so they were bringing people back to the law of Moses, back to the rituals, back to the ceremonies, 
to keep the law of Moses because, after all, the covenants that God made all throughout history have been with whom? The Jews, with Israel, the chosen people. So now you have the gospel going to non-Jewish areas, Gentile areas, people believing in Jesus as the Messiah, not just the Jewish Messiah, their Messiah, their Savior. And that caused some of these Jewish Christians to go, now wait a minute, hold your horses, back up, not so fast. They need to do something first before they just live in grace. This was a problem early on in the book of Acts in chapter 15. Uh, men from Judea went up to Antioch and said, unless you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, this was bothersome to Paul and Barnabas and Peter in Jerusalem. They all convened a council in Acts chapter 15 to settle the issue. Well, the issue was never really settled. It was settled in Paul's mind. It was settled in Peter's mind. It's settled in Scripture. But it wasn't settled in the minds of some who seemed to be following Paul wherever he would go and bring his message of the gospel and would come in after Paul to bring people on their side, to say, to talk smack about Paul, to say, you know, you, Paul is unreliable and he's uh, really not an apostle like you think, you know, an apostle should be. We are the apostles from Jerusalem. We represent the church in Jerusalem and we represent Judaism. And they were trying to undo much of what Paul had done in giving the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. So they became a problem. They became a thorn in Paul's side because they were bringing people back into bondage. Basically, the Judaizers, as Paul saw them, they were parasites. Because Instead of going out on their own and starting churches, being a church planter, which is very difficult to do, to go into an area, to get a job, to share the gospel, to put up with all the flack you get, to establish a local church, etc. Instead of doing that, they just were looking to see where Paul went. And then when Paul left, would go to that group and worm their way into the group that Paul started. So they weren't winning people to Christ, rather they are weaning people from Christ. Saying, Jesus, as Paul preached, faith in Jesus, as Paul preached, is a good start, but it's only a start. You need more. You need to add something to that. You need to add circumcision. You need to add keeping the law of Moses. They were taking people back, and, and I find this to be a trend even to this day. Uh, some Christians get so excited about Hebraisms and Old Testament theology and some of the Jewish uh, rites and rituals, the Passover, and, and uh, well, I don't celebrate Easter, I celebrate Pesach. And, and they will get, try to get so original, they become legalistic. And they, they are... They, they complicate things instead of just making it simple. And so that was going on, and it raised Paul's ire, and he wrote this book. Paul wrote this book, we believe, on his third missionary journey. He had gone to Galatia on his first journey. I'll talk about that in a moment. He went there again on his second journey. On his third journey, he heard, you know, things aren't going as well as you'd like, Paul, in Galatia. So he wrote this letter. We don't exactly know where from. Some think he wrote it from Corinth. I believe he wrote it for the two to three years that he was living in Ephesus and teaching there. Uh, that was sort of a headquarters for him for a few years. He heard what was going on to his west over in Galatia, and so he writes this letter. Now, the letter of Galatians has been called the Christian's Declaration of Independence, and I like that. Paul's magnum opus was the book of Romans, but close to that is the book of Galatians, and it really is, uh, in a shortened form, our declaration of independence, more so even than Romans. It's all about freedom. It's all about liberty. It's all about being set free simply by God's favor, by God's grace. 
Martin Luther loved this book. He loved the book of Romans, too, but he loved Galatians. In fact, I brought with me, I just wanted to do this a little show and tell tonight. I brought with me my copy of Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians. It's over 500 pages. Now, I brought this book because it's special in my library. This book itself, it was written by Paul in the, uh, by Paul, it was written by Martin Luther uh, in the 1500s, but this is published not in German, but in English. This book was published in 1749. So I'm holding a book that's older than America. This book was published over in Edinburgh, Scotland, before America became a nation. So it's fun just to go through these pages, and I have been going through it this week, just reading some of the things Luther um, uh, wrote about it. And, and one of the first things he says in his opening remarks is, I can't believe I've had this much to say about this book. That's, that's how he kind of begins it. And he said, uh, you know, but the book shows that I obviously had a lot to say about this book. But he loved it. He said about the book of Galatians, it is my, my Catherine. It is my Catherine. If you know a little bit of history, Catherine von Braun was his wife. And so uh, he said, it, it's my Katie. It's my wife. I feel like I'm married to it. I'm wed to it. I love it that much. Uh, and on, a, on a spiritual plane, you, you, you get his drift. Because it so resonated with Martin Luther's fight against the papacy and, and, and the, the works and the laboriousness from which he had come. So uh, just a fun little uh, an aside to, to show you um, how much Martin Luther loved this book. Now, the emphasis of the book of Galatians is, in a word, justification by faith. Justification by faith. We've talked about that. We've described that on a number of occasions. But this comes through loud and clear that we are made right with God just before God simply by believing in Jesus. You don't add anything to it. The moment you do, it's not the gospel. People say, yeah, but what about works? We'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that in the book of James, which we're going to start in a few weeks on a weekend and uh, James takes the Christian life from a different perspective, that if it's true faith, if you are truly justified by faith, you will produce works. But here, Paul's emphasis, because of the Judaizers, is justification by faith. And you can see that by words that are repeated in the book of Galatians. The word law is appears 32 times in this book. The word faith appears 21 times. So you, you have the law versus faith, and he is comparing the two on a personal level, on a doctrinal level, and on a, an applicational level. Um, a word about Galatia, because it begins by saying, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all their brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Galatians is a little bit different than some of the other letters Paul wrote because when Paul wrote the other letters, he was writing to one city. Ephesus was a city. The book of Ephesians was written to those who lived in that city. Colossians was written to those who lived in the city of Colossae. Thessalonians were those who lived in Thessalonica. Not so Galatia. Galatia wasn't a city. Galatia was a province, an area, like a state. Uh, it was uh, an area that had several cities. And when Paul went there on his first missionary journey, he established churches in several Galatian cities. Uh, first of all, Antioch of, of Pisidia. There's two Antiochs, Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. These are all towns in southern Galatia. Galatia literally means land of the Gauls, hence the term Galatia, the land where the Gauls live, G-A-U-L, 
a Gaul were people originally from France who moved to this area of Asia Minor and it became known as their land, their country, the land where the Gauls moved and settled. Most of the ethnic Gauls were up north. Most of the people who resided in the region from different backgrounds lived in the southern cities where Paul established the churches. So it's to a group of churches in the area, to the churches, verse 2 of Galatia. The great theme of the book, as I've already stated, is the theme of grace. Now you tell me, what does grace mean? Unmerited favor. Any other definitions? Undeserved favor. Um, God's lavish uh, goodness. Um, here's a way to think of grace. Think of it as an acronym, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. That is what grace is. God deals with you lavishly because of the expense that Jesus paid on the cross for you. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for you, that is enough for God to treat you as though you were flawless, as though you were without sin. He justifies you just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. So God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is the great theme of this book. Paul, let's begin again. An apostle. What's an apostle? How many are there? Well, there are 12. In a technical sense, in a primary sense, um, Paul, of course, wasn't one of the original 12. Uh, even when Judas died and defected and then killed himself, they had to replace him. They didn't replace him with Paul. Paul wasn't even in the picture. They replaced him with Matthias in the book of Acts. And, and that's because there were certain qualifications to be one of the original apostles. You had to be with Jesus in his earthly ministry. You had to have been a witness of his resurrection by the way, Paul qualified for that. You had to have certain signs that accompany an apostle. Paul qualified for that. But there were other people besides the 12 who were called apostles in the New Testament. So I just want you to, in your mind, divide doctrinally the original 12 apostles versus an apostolic calling not of the original 12. What do I mean by apostolic calling? Um, what I mean is the word apostle simply means sent out or sent on a mission. So all of y'all, in that sense, all y'all are apostles. You're sent out. You're commissioned by God. So, for example, Barnabas is called an apostle in the New Testament. Timothy is called an apostle. Uh, in the New Testament. Sylvan Sylvanus is called an apostle. Andronicus, Junia are all called apostles in the New Testament in a secondary sense. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. You know how Paul got saved. He was Saul of Tarsus, who had a very interesting meeting on the road to Damascus. He was going there to, um, he, he was part of the Jewish cancel culture. He was canceling all Christians. He was arresting them, throwing them into prison, even threatening them uh, uh, with uh, uh, death. An interesting thing happened to him on the way to Damascus. He got saved. He was called by Jesus because Jesus appeared to him in the Damascus road. He didn't receive it from men. It wasn't through man. It was a direct calling because of a direct revelation of Jesus Christ to him. There are some groups, some denominations, some segments of Christianity and even Christendom, those who are, I would consider outside Christianity but are part of Christendom, who make a big deal about what they call apostolic succession. The Catholic Church is one of those groups. 
You know, we can trace our lineage uh, from the, this pope to that pope to that pope, had his hand, hands laid on him all the way back to Peter. Uh, the Mormon church will do the same. They have 12 apostles and they have an apostolic succession. The Eastern Orthodox Church, apostolic succession. Paul comes on the scene and says, I'm not part of that. It wasn't that I got my hands laid on me by Peter. In fact, he just said, yeah, I, I met with Peter. I was just with him a couple weeks, but that's it. Wasn't a big deal. What was a big deal, bigger than Peter, bigger than a pope, bigger than the Orthodox Church, is Jesus Christ personally commissioned him. We often get the question, well, what gives you the authority? Who, who is it that grants you the authority as a pastor, as a church, as a leader? It's a good question. It's a fair question. It's a question they asked John the Baptist. Was he baptizing down by the Jordan River, at the Jordan River? Who gave you the authority? Where'd you get it? They asked Jesus Christ the same question. They asked Paul the same question, and evidently the Judaizers were saying he doesn't have any real authority like we do. We're part of the original gang, the covenant people of the Jewish race in Jerusalem. So they made a big deal out of it. Paul said, bigger than getting ordained by man, I've been commissioned and ordained by God. By the way, we have an ordination service here at this church. We uh, take uh, young men in the ministry, we train them up, we license them, and eventually we ordain them. But we never see ordination as we are the ones commissioning them or we are the ones ordaining them. We are simply recognizing that God has ordained that individual. It's more of a ratification. We can't call or equip anybody in ministry. We can come alongside and augment what God has given in terms of a gift, but we can never provide what God hasn't naturally, supernaturally provided. But when he does naturally, supernaturally provide in a person's life, we can look at a person, recognize it, and say, yeah, we ratify that. We'll give you an ordination certificate, which is saying we agree that God has his hand on your life. But that's all we can do. It has to come from God. And with Paul, it did. It came directly as a direct revelation through Christ um, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Boy, I, I better, I better <laughs> put my foot on the gas. And all the brethren who are with me, we don't know who those brethren are. Could have been Luke, could have been Tychicus, could have been a number of people. To the churches, plural, of Galatia. Remember, Paul started preaching the gospel and churches were formed in Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Great work of God had been established on Paul's first missionary journey. Grace to you. Paul begins his letters typically like this. Grace to you and peace from God. I love that Paul begins all of his letters with this little formula, grace and peace, grace and peace. It is singular. In antiquity, you would have greetings like grace to you or peace to you, but he combines like the typical Greek greeting, grace. Um, charis would be the term they would have used back then. Charis, grace. And then the typical Jewish greeting, even to this day, shalom, peace. But the way Paul uses it is very expressive. In fact, I was just reading in Martin Luther's commentary before uh, I came up on the platform. Paul said the whole gospel is summed up in that little introduction, grace and peace. And here's why. You'll never know the peace of God until you know the grace of God. When you do experience the grace of God, then you experience the peace of God. So it's appropriate. Grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, 
that he might deliver us from the, this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Now just a word on the name of Jesus in verse 3. What are the three words that describe him in that verse? Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is not his first name. It's not like first name, Lord, middle name, Jesus, last name, Christ. That's not how it worked. Lord was his title. His earthly name was Yeshua, Jesus. It was a very common, typical name. But the name given to him by God the Father, acknowledged by God the Father, is he is Lord. Philippians will say, Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's important. God has given him a name which is above every name. Is that the name Jesus? No, that's his earthly name. A lot of guys were named Jesus. The name that God the Father gave to him that is different from every other name and higher than every other name is the title Lord. God the Father acknowledged this is the Lord of all. So Lord, he is the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, Yehoshua, God is salvation. The name means Christ, the Greek form of Mashiach, of the anointed one, the Messiah, who gave himself for our sins that he might. Now, this is interesting, because if you were to ask the average Christian, why did Jesus die on a cross? To save me. Yes, that's true. But when he saved you, he had more in mind than just saving you from hell. What he has in mind, what he wants to do is not just save you, but to deliver you from this present evil age. That's separation. That's sanctification. Now, don't you find it interesting that 2,000 years ago, Paul looked at his world and said it was an evil age? We say, well, it wasn't as bad as it is today. It's always been bad. I want you to know that. It's always been evil. He's not speaking about a certain period of time as much as just the world system, the world as opposed to Christ. He came to deliver us from this present evil age or from uh, this world. According to the will of God, our God, and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's the introduction. Now he turns the heat up. Now he puts the boxing gloves on. Now he puts the war paint on. No words of you guys are awesome and I heard about this, about you, and I'm praying for you here and there. He just gets cuts right to the chase in verse 6. He says, I marvel. I'm shocked. I'm blown away, we would say. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. That word, by the way, turning away means to turn back, to turn away from, or to put in reverse. You are reversing the work of God's grace in your life. You're going backwards, not forwards. You're going back to bondage. You're going back to legalism. Instead of standing in freedom, you're turning back. And I, I'm blown away. I'm shocked. I marvel that it happened so soon. It hadn't been many years, and already the gospel is being perverted. Now, it's been 2,000 years. Don't you think the gospel's had its challenges in that time? Don't you think this is always a warning for us? If it happened so soon back then, think of today. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, from 
him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, because there's only one gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. To these Judaizers, to these false teachers, to these people who evidently came from Jerusalem and were following Paul in his ministry and trying to undo what he had done, he has some pretty strict words. To them, faith was not enough. It was a good start. It's kind of like, well, I'm so glad you accepted Jesus. Now, what you need to add to Jesus, add to faith, is this, 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 and that. And Paul, man, he bristles at this. What's going on here? Well, cut them a little slack. Cut these Judaizers a little slack. Cut the Jewish people a little slack. The first Christians were all Jews. All they knew was temple worship. All they knew was ritual rites, ceremonies, circumcision, etc., etc., wearing the skull cap, the, the you know, phylacteries on the heads and the uh, hair on the sides, etc., all that stuff. Keeping kosher, that's all they knew. Moreover, they knew the covenants that God had made with the Jewish people. It wasn't easy transitioning to just believing in the one God sent, and that that's enough. They couldn't wrap their, their Jewish minds around that, right? Even Peter had problems with this. Peter's on a rooftop in Joppa, and he sees a vision around midday, right around lunchtime, right when he's getting hungry, and he sees a sheet being let down from heaven with all sorts of unkosher animals on them, and God speaks to him and says, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, no way. Not so, Lord. Which is a perfect contradiction. Not so, Lord. Master. You don't say not so, but he did. Not so, Lord. I've never had anything common or unclean. God said, don't call common what I've cleansed. He didn't know what that meant. Happened once, happened twice, happened three times. He's going, I don't know what that means. Well, I wouldn't either. Until he gets a knock at the door, he's invited to somebody's house named Cornelius, a Gentile. And he goes to Cornelius' house and he says to Cornelius, look, Cornelius, you know that it's unlawful for a Jew, me, to even hang out with you, a Gentile. I can't even come in your house. You know my law. You, you, you live around these parts. But God has shown me that I can't call common or unclean those people, those that he has cleansed. God was giving him a crash course in grace. It was difficult, though, for Peter to get through that at first. Then they had the confrontation, as I mentioned, Acts 15, the Jerusalem council happened. And Peter testified there, and Paul and Barnabas testified there as well. But uh, uh, it is still an issue. And it's still an issue to this day. What's the issue? The issue is how do I get right with God? How am I righteous before God? How do I get to heaven? How, how am I saved? To most people, you are saved by doing something. Not by believing something, but by doing something. It's called righteousness by rule keeping. And why is that dangerous? Because... If you keep all the rules, or you think you keep all the rules, then you walk away from your rule-keeping session and go, I'm saved because I kept the rules. When you are righteous because you do something, that's called self-righteousness. You're righteous not as a gift, but you earned it, baby. I got saved the old-fashioned way. I earned it. Remember that commercial? A little bit different than that. If you remember that commercial, you're old. Just saying. But it's like, you know, we make money the old-fashioned way. They, we earned it. So um, that was the old-fashioned way, and that was an issue, and it is still an issue to this day. 
What happened when Jesus died on the cross in the temple? What was torn in two? The veil. That was a very picturesque way of God saying, I am removing the barrier. You can all come close, all draw near, all have intimacy with God, all have fellowship with God. To prove that my son's sacrifice is enough, get a load of this. <laughs> he ripped it. It was God's gracious way of doing this. You all come. I'll take anyone who will believe because of what he has done on that cross. That transaction is enough for me to graciously, freely receive you. You know what they did with the veil? History tells us they sewed it back up. I, you know, you, you repair something that gets, gets broken. But that's picturesque as well. That's, that's what we do. Mankind has this insatiable appetite to make difficult what God makes simple, to complicate what God makes so simple. Hey, I've made it easy. You just come as you are and believe. No, 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 no. I got to stitch up the veil and keep the rules and wear the skull cap and be kosher and keep Pesach and say Hebrew words and do all these things because I'll feel good. Okay, you can do it if it just makes you feel good and you want to get close to your roots. But if you do it because you think you're a better Christian than somebody else, you're self-righteous. And you're sewing up the veil. And Paul says, I am blown away that it didn't take long for that to happen. To a different gospel, which is not another. It's, there's not good news when you say, you've got to do this, this, and that to be saved. There's no good news there. The good news is, you believe in him. So he takes off the, puts on the boxing gloves. And then in verse 8, watch this. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. If you were going to bed tonight and you fell asleep... And in the middle of the night, you were awakened by a shining being at the foot of your bed who introduced himself as one of God's angels chosen to speak to you, to give the message to the world. And you are the chosen vessel to bring that message. And you have to, and, and then here's five rules I'm giving you to tell people that you must do that. Because you've seen an angelic appearance, you would, you would get all excited, perhaps, what you should do is say to that angelic being, you're accursed. If it's a different gospel than what the New Testament says is the gospel, you're accursed. By the way, do you know how strong of a word that is? It's the word anathema in Greek. Anathema means uh, devoted to destruction, cursed below the lowest hell. It is Paul saying, if anybody brings a different gospel, let him be damned. That's how strong of language anathema is, accursed is. This is how passionate Paul is about the gospel and anybody adding anything to it. If, if we are an angel from heaven, have there been supposed angels from heaven who have appeared to people in the past? Well, let's see, 1823, an angel Moroni supposedly appeared to Joseph Smith telling him where the secret tablets were buried, the reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, to bring what he called another gospel. And it does compete with this gospel. In the year 610 AD, supposedly Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and gave the beginning of the Quran to him by revelation. Among the first words, supposedly, the angel said to Muhammad is, God does not beget, nor is he begotten. 
That's a way of slamming the virgin birth or the unique sonship of Jesus Christ. God does not beget, nor is he begotten. And if you go to Jerusalem, when you come with us and you look at the golden dome of the rock and you say, what is that Arabic script that is written all around the dome of the rock so everybody in Jerusalem can see it? It's a slam on Jesus Christ. God does not beget, nor is he begotten. An angel, though. It's an angelic appearance. If we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So just listen, you have a gauge. It's called the Bible. If I get an appearance from an angel, it's cool. Lay it on me, angel. Uh, what do you got to say? And what he or she has to say is what I judge that, that experience by. Oh, but I had tingles, and I saw bright lights, and... Okay. What did he say? What was the message? Well, it was just... okay, now take the message and compare it to this. If it's... In sync with this, awesome, you're good to go. It's a confirmation of this. If it's something other than this, it's not a confirmation, it's a competition to this. It's another gospel. And let him be accursed. So you have a gauge. You have the word of God. For, verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be the servant of Christ. These Judaizers, these false teachers, apparently went to the churches of Galatia and accused Paul of adjusting his message to please people. Can't trust Paul. He's just a people pleaser. You know, when he's with the Jews, he acts Jewish. When he's with the Gentiles, he acts Gentiles. You, he's not reliable. It's just a people-pleasing message. Now, they probably took what Paul said when he wrote to the Corinthians. Remember, he said, I become all things to all men, if by all means I may save some. And they took that, misinterpreted that to mean he's one way with a group of, of people, a different way with another group, just trying to lay a message on them that's pleasing. Actually, Paul says that's not true. Actually, what is true, you want to know what's really true? You want to know what's really pleasing to people? Legalism. And you say, legalism? That wouldn't be appealing. Actually, it is. It makes people feel safe. Oh, those are the rules. Okay, I'm going to strive to keep those rules because when I do, then I feel I'm good now. God and I are good now. So it's, it's that message that is appealing because most of the world's religion is that way. There's only two religions in the entire world. You say, Skip, I think you need to go, uh, go Google that again because uh, there are like thousands of them. Actually, there's only two. Religion number one, the religion of human accomplishment or human achievement. The religion of human achievement. The other one, the religion of divine accomplishment. The gospel we preach is the message of divine accomplishment. God has done it. Jesus has done it. He paid the price. We believe in him. We are saved. We have a relationship with God. He changes our lives. All the other religious systems human accomplishment or achievement. I, I'm going to achieve it. I'm going to work hard to get it. So, verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Have you ever thought about the message we believe in? And how when people say, well, you know, somebody just made that up. That's a man-made belief, you, what you believe about Jesus dying on a cross. And, and, and when, when they say that, say, well, people make that up. 
I say, who on earth would make anything like that up? If I'm going to make up a religion, it ain't going to be this one. I'm going to, you're saying that we're going to make up a religion that virtually condemns the entire world to an eternal hell unless they come one way? That's not appealing to anybody. That is an affront to everybody, naturally speaking. Nobody would make that up. You would make up easy beliefism, or you would make up one of the Old Testament religions of Baalism, where there's sensual, sexual worship. Something that, you know, there's a free lunch or a sensual experience or something. That's the kind of religion people make up. Not this one. So I couldn't stress that enough. This message, this gospel, is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. The word means to sack a city, to destroy it, to devoid it of any power. Paul saw Christianity as a threat. And he was part of the cancel culture, the Jewish cancel culture. I've got to cancel Christianity. I've got to do everything I can to stop this movement because I hear they're now leaving Jerusalem and going up to Damascus, so I'm going to cut it off right there. He saw it as a threat. In Acts chapter 9, it says, As for Saul, Saul of Tarsus, a.k.a. Paul the Apostle, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Paul says, My testimony is well known, how I sacked the church, or I tried to destroy it. Now, who was this guy? Paul, originally Saul, was a Jewish leader, born around A.D. 1 by our calendar. He was born in Tarsus, a town of Cilicia. Cilicia is where Turkey and Syria meet, right in that area. It was a cosmopolitan town when Paul lived there. Uh, there was about 500,000 people that lived in Cilicia. We had universities. It was uh, known for advanced learning. But it was principally known for its Cilicium. The province Cilicia was named after the black goat's hair harvested from black goats called Cilicium that was made into tents. So Paul's father was probably a master skenapios, was the Greek word, tent maker, and Paul learned that trade from his dad because wherever Paul went, he also was a skenapios, a tent maker, using hides and hair to make tents as making a living. So he had that background. Uh, he was Jewish, we know that. We uh, also know that he was a Roman citizen. He was a civis Romanus, uh, they would call it. A Roman citizen was very unique. You could only become a Roman citizen one of four different ways. You had to either be born into it, or number two, you uh, got it as a, um, if you were in the military for a few years, they would grant you Roman citizenship. If it was given to you by the emperor as a gift because you did some great thing, he could give you, grant you Roman citizenship. And the fourth way is you could purchase it. It would cost, the average going rate for Civis Romanus was two years wage of a working man would pay for Roman citizenship. So remember when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem because he stirred up the crowd and uh, the Roman soldier said, tie him up, beat him, flog him, find out what he said, because he's speaking in Hebrew to this crowd. We don't understand that language. So beat him, find out what he said. And Paul said, would you flog a Roman citizen? And the, and the uh, guard said, Roman citizen? Wait a minute. I paid a lot of money for Roman citizenship. How did you become one? Paul said, I was free born. I was born into it. So if you were a Roman citizen, it granted you certain rights, certain privileges. 
Number one, if you were in a court of law and you felt like you were not getting a fair trial, you could appeal directly to Caesar himself and you would have audience with Caesar in Rome. So when Paul felt like the trials in Caesarea were at an impasse, he was getting falsely accused, he couldn't get out of it, he finally said, you know what, I am laying this case at Caesar's tribunal, I appeal to Caesar. And they said, you appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. It could only happen if you were a Roman citizen. That's how Paul got to stand before Caesar Nero and give his defense. He was Civus Romanus. So he is from Cilicia, he's Jewish, he is a Roman citizen, he speaks Greek, he speaks Latin, he speaks Hebrew, he speaks Aramaic, he's very well educated. And he was steeped in Judaism because, uh, he mentions it here, but he had a very interesting mentor and you know who he is, he's mentioned in the book of Acts. Who, who taught Paul the apostle in Judaism? Gamaliel, Rabbi Gamaliel, the grandson of the famous Rabbi Hillel. Gamaliel wrote something very nasty against the Christian church. Very, very bad against them. I've shared that with you before. Just know Paul was, was mentored by him. So that's part of his background under Gamaliel. Gamaliel, by the way, was so influential, he was given the title by the Jews, the beauty of the law. The beauty of the law. He is the beauty of the law. This guy's teaching is so sublime, so pure, so Old Testament biblical. He is the beauty of the law incarnate. And when he died, uh, the Talmud says, since Rabbi Gamaliel has passed away, the glory of the law has ceased. So he was held in high esteem. Paul was mentored by him in Judaism. He makes reference to that here. But he says, you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And how I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly jealous for the traditions of my father. Don't do it now, but maybe write in the margin of your Bible, if you have the freedom to do so, or in your notes, write down Philippians 3 and go read that later, where Paul gives Likewise, his pedigree, his background. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am of the stock of Israel, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. King Saul was from Benjamin. First king was from the tribe of Benjamin. I came from that tribe. So, and then he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrew parents. I'm um, steeped in Judaism, a Jew through and through who became a Jew born anew uh, as time went on. But uh, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning um, the righteousness which comes by the law, Paul said, I was perfect. That's an interesting statement. I, I won't get into it now, but Paul is, you know, I look at the Old Testament law and I've always said nobody can keep it. Paul comes on and goes, actually, I've kept it. I've done a pretty good job of keeping, of doing um, righteousness by rule keeping. Kept all the laws. But then he said, those things that were gained to me, they're dung, refuse. Pile of you know what is, is the literal term. Uh, con as I compare that to the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. He's very colorful in that description in Philippians. Uh, I'll move on here. But, verse 15, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But get this. I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now next week I'm gonna give you, I was gonna do it this week, but I'm looking at the time, I wanted to give you the chronology of all that together, I'll do that next time, but it would make sense if this Jewish boy from Tarsus, 
trained in Jerusalem, who leaves Jerusalem, goes to Damascus, gets saved on the way, the first thing that would make most sense is he goes back to Jerusalem, confers with the church. But he goes, I didn't do that. I spent three years in Arabia. Why would he go to Arabia? It's, that's a broad term. It could not just mean Saudi Arabia. It could mean Nabataean Arabia. Probably that's what it meant. It could include Mount Sinai. I'm guessing uh, Paul, who kept the law, who said he was blameless, went to the place where the law was given at the foot of Mount Sinai in Arabia. And here, where the law was given to Moses, here the message of grace was given to Paul's heart, the new covenant. And he will make a comparison between uh, the old law of Mount Sinai and the new covenant in this book later on we will read. So maybe there he's working through for three years in the desert his theological stance that he would write in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians. He's hammering that down because he has to undo all that he learned. And probably he is personally tutored by the Lord himself because he said, I didn't get the message from people. I got it directly from the Lord. So maybe by direct revelation for three years, he was in Arabia. By the way, some of the greatest people in the world get sent to the desert. Moses left the Nile, beautiful Nile region, was sent to the desert for 40 years. He was called by God. His ministry began at age 80. Take heart as you're getting older. <laughs> Best years of his life were past 80. And uh, uh, that's one of them. David was another one. He was chased by Saul for 10 years. He went down to the deserts of En Gedi by the Dead Sea. Joseph was sent to Egypt where he was in prison. Some of the greatest men of God were given BSD degrees, backside of the desert degrees. They were trained apart from people by the Lord, working things out before God, uh, before beginning their ministry. So he went from Damascus to Arabia, then returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, this is after the post-Arabia Tutelage. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. There are two James, right, that we know of um, principally. There's James and John, sons of Zebedee. That's not this James. That James was dead already. He was... Uh, um, murdered by Herod. Uh, this is James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, grew up in the same home as Jesus. So his parents were Mary and Joseph. Um, Jesus' parents were Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. So James was a half-brother who did not believe, by the way, uh, in Jesus at first, until the resurrection, came to believe. And the leader of the first church was not Peter. This was a shock to me growing up Catholic. When I read the book of Acts and I go, it wasn't Peter, it was James. James was the spokesperson and was the leader to whom Peter and the others submitted. So he met with Peter, met with James. Now concerning the things which I write to you indeed, I write before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So he goes back home. He gets saved on the way to Damascus, goes up to Damascus, Leaves Damascus, goes to Arabia three years. After three years, goes back to Damascus, then goes to Jerusalem. He's there just for a couple weeks. Um, things get really hot there, so he has to leave. They want him to leave. They send him back to his hometown uh, in Cilicia, where he grew up. He went back home. Before he was used by God, he went back home. Remember the... Demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5, 
He said, I'm going to come with you, Jesus. This is awesome, man. I'm healed. I'm saved. I'm going to follow you. Jesus said, you're not following me. Go back home. Tell your family the great things God has done for you. So Paul first uh, faced his, his self, his own self and his God in Arabia for three years. He then faced his enemies in Damascus. He faced his family back home. All of that made him ready to face the world. He was in Tarsus, in Cilicia, we think for about seven years. So from the time he was saved to the time he was used by God, he first shows up in Antioch, because Barnabas brings him there. We'll get to that next week. He's probably about 10 years. You know why that's important? Because whenever we see somebody famous like Paul, who's like, wow, this guy's such an anti-Christian guy. As soon as they get saved, we want to put him in the spotlight, interview him at our church. Oh, he's a rock and roll star. Bring him in. Let him talk. No. Don't let him say anything because he's going to say something stupid. <laughs> let him earn influence by humbling himself and getting discipled for a while. Then he has something to say. So Paul had something to say eventually after he was uh, discipled and he comes back. And we'll close off the chapter. I was uh, unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. They were only hearing, uh, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. So they, they couldn't recognize me if I walked down the street and had a falafel in their town. But they heard my testimony. They knew about this, my story. And they glorified God in me. Jesus said, so let your light shine before men that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If you're doing ministry right, people won't say, you're awesome. They'll say, God is awesome. Now, we'll get more into the gospel of grace as we go further on it next week. But let's just, let's just revel for a moment, shall we? In the fact that God reached Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the Apostle. No one is beyond the grasp of the grace of God. You have no right to give up on anybody. God can reach him. God can save him. That's the glaring lesson that comes out here. Also, the glaring lesson is the problem with most people isn't that they're not good enough to be saved but that they're not bad enough to be saved. I'll explain that as we close. Most people think, well, I, I haven't been to church because my life isn't together. And I, I'll get good enough. Stop it. The problem isn't that you're not good enough. The, the problem is you, you, you don't, you're not bad enough. You don't see how bad you really are that would force you to the foot of the cross in the grace of God that he would freely give you. So most people don't see that they're really bad, don't see that they're fallen. They hide behind their religion. They hide behind their righteousness. Well, I, I, I go to church and I've always believed and I do this. I, I, I. That's self-righteousness. You think you're better than you are. The truth is, you are so bad off. It's pathetic how bad off you are. And yet God loves you with an eternal love and will take you as you are and save you as you are and make you his child. That's the gospel. Any other message isn't the gospel. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that Paul loved you and loved the message enough to fight for it, to speak out for it. And Lord, we love God's riches at Christ's expense. We love unmerited, undeserved favor that is ours for the asking if we simply come and believe in Jesus. Thank you for that. We live in that. We love you for it. I'm just praying, Lord, if there's one or two or ten who are with us who 
have been hiding behind rule keeping or religion or background or denomination or parentage would get away from that very thin and unreliable shield and be vulnerable enough to say, I need Christ. The one who died for me, the one who paid the price for me. If you're here with us tonight, you've never given your life to Christ. Authentically, personally, individually, you've never surrendered your life to Christ. I want to give you an opportunity. You say, well, how, how do I know? If, well, just ask yourself this question. If I were to die tonight, am I absolutely certain I'd be in heaven? If not, then you need to make certain. And it's coming simply by faith. Others of you remember some religious past experience, but you're not walking in obedience right now. So you need to come back. You need to renew that commitment. You need to re-engage. If either of those categories describes you, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I want you to raise your hand up in the air if you want to receive Christ and be forgiven and be a child of God. If you want that, just raise your hand up high so I can see it. I'll acknowledge you. God bless you. Toward the back on my left. Who else? Just raise your hand up. You're just saying, yep, pray for me. God bless you. Who else? Who else? Way in the back. God bless you and you. Now let's all stand to our feet. And those of you who raise your hands just right now, right where you're standing, say this, Lord, I give you my life. I affirm my commitment. I believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross, rose from the dead. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my savior. Help me to live for him as my Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.